remind you especially about the coming conference. Um, as you know, this is our 31st year in which we are hosting the Zambian uh, Reformed Conference. 31 years. I'm not quite sure which group of churches have consistently held their conferences this way. So it's a, it's a real privilege. And this year specifically, as we have now entered into the 30s, so to speak, we have uh, Dr. Ted Tripp, who was willing to cross over with his wife to come and preach at the conference here, despite COVID-19. But we knew that with so many brethren uh, sheltering away in their homes, it was going to be much better that we handle it virtually. So it's going to be on the internet, and we really need to plead with every one of you to ensure that you have registered. Uh, please do so. Right now we are in the 400s, but really we ought to be shooting beyond 1,000. And we'd like to just make sure that we, we do that. It's a free conference. It's on biblical parenting. Uh, so it's either something that's ahead of you or something you're involved in or something that is behind you and you need to still be counseling uh, other people who are raising their kids. Whichever way it is, it's one of the biggest responsibilities that we have before God in uh, ensuring that we are preparing the next generation. So my plea is make sure that you register. The conference begins in eight days' time uh, on Monday the 24th all the way to the 28th. And we're dealing with a lot of different subjects that are related to parenting. Okay, so not just those of you who are in here, but also those who are live streaming the same appeal. Go to either the Kabwata Baptist Church website or the Lusaka Baptist Church website and fill in your details. It just takes less than two to three minutes and it's done. It will help those who are planning, but even you, in terms of the fact that we'll be sending you updates as uh, we are going towards the conference and also right across the conference itself. Okay, so that's my plea. And uh, make sure you do that. And please also, whenever you see any advert on social media, just click on share so that it spreads to your friends. Okay, don't just say hallelujah, I can see it. Just share, we need to get word out. Good, well, we are continuing in our series of messages um, entitled One Day in the Life of, and we're dealing with different Old Testament characters. And basically what we are seeking to do is to see from these individuals that uh, one day in their lives was where their future fortunes turned, either for good or for bad. And it's the same with us. And that's the reason why we ought to be extra careful about our lives, because inevitably we also come to uh, T-junctions in our lives when we have to make decisions one way or the other. And we could make a real mess of our lives by making a decision that goes the wrong way. We've looked at Adam, we've looked at Eve, we've looked at Cain, and in Cain's situation we saw how jealousy is so dangerous. Here was an individual who, because he did not tame jealousy in his own heart, caused the first murder in human history. And that not of a stranger, it was his only brother, his only blood brother. And so if there's a lesson we learned last time, it is that we need to quickly cut the root of bitterness, of jealousy, of envy, before it causes us to destroy others. We're moving on today to the fourth person, and that person is Noah. No one. This time, thankfully, it's a good example that we are dealing with. 
uh, because he was a righteous man living in the midst of a corrupt world. The example that we learn from him for our own good is, is quite simple. And it is this, that we should not um, be deceived by the fact that because so many people are corrupt, so many people are living lives of immorality, that therefore God may have just shut his eyes towards what is going on. He hasn't. Uh, and so it matters that even if you're the only one, you must remain faithful to God. In our reading, we basically just reading uh, verse 11 of Genesis 7 up to verse 16 to begin with. But we will make our way through a wider section very shortly. So let's, let's begin with uh, that one day, that one day in the life of Noah. And the Bible reads Genesis 7 and verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons, with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Which is the title of my message this morning. It is the day God shut Noah in the ark. Well, I've already said that the one lesson that we really need to learn is don't be deceived by the ungodliness, the worldliness, the uh, wickedness of people around you, and therefore you beginning to think it must be okay to live like this, because it isn't. And that's the very first lesson that we learn uh, when we begin from chapter 6 and verse 9. Chapter 6 and verse 9, because what we have before us here is the story of Noah that sort of begins with an introduction, which we will see to begin with, and then it begins to build up towards the climax. Again, we are going to see that part. And then finally, you have the climax when Noah enters the ark and God shuts the door. And then from there, you have the epilogue, which is the destruction the massive destruction that takes place when Noah is safely hidden in the ark. In this introduction, you see fairly evidently that it matters how you live before God. That's, that's the, the most important issue. It is not what you have accumulated in a material and physical sense. It is how you live before God. That's what God takes note of the most. And we see this in the introduction to this story in Genesis 6, verse 9 to verse 11. Listen to the way Noah is introduced. Verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. 
We see there that Noah is introduced in contrast to everybody else on the planet in terms of his blamelessness, his, his righteousness. Um, we, we, we is introduced as one who walked with God. And then only after that are we told that Noah had three sons. Now I know that's not the way the world would primarily describe us. Uh, the world has a tendency to describe us in terms of the things we accumulate to ourselves. It's in terms of um, uh, what property you own, it's in terms of you know, how many children you have, it is in terms of the way in which the, the world has promoted you in its own sight and so on. The, the world rarely thinks of you primarily in terms of this man or this woman walked with God. And yet that's the most important. Because everything else that the world seems to emphasize, well, when the day of death comes, we leave them behind. We never take any of those things with us. But when you are blameless and upright and, and you're walking with God, well, you finally go into God's presence. In other words, death does not curtail anything when your emphasis is on such a basis. And what particularly comes out in this text is the contrast, because on the opposite end is the rest of the earth. And we are told there, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And yet often, we have this attitude of saying, well, you know, the reason why I'm not living a life of holiness and righteousness and so on is because, you know, the other people in my home, they, they are immoral. The, the people in my office, they, they, they are wicked. The, the, the people at school, they, they are evil. So I, I also find that I'm doing what they're doing. I'm saying that's no excuse. Because as you can see here, no one was living among a wicked people. And yet, it's fairly evident that he was righteous. So while you are using other people as an excuse, hey, when you meet with God on the judgment day, he will simply point to Noah and say, that's no excuse. You must still shine like the sun in the darkness, like the stars in the midnight sky. You should still stand out as Noah did. Well, that's what we learn about him in the introduction. But as the story begins to build up, the lesson that we learn here is that the God who exists is a God who punishes sinners and is also a God who saves his people. He's a God who punishes sinners and is a God who saves his people. Let's quickly see this from verse 12 down to verse 21. And I'll comment as we go along so that you can see this seesaw that God is being um, manifested about. Verse 12. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. We are being shown there that the God who is there is a God who sees. He's a God who sees everything that we are doing. A God who knows how you have lived for the last one week. A God who knows how you have lived for the last one month. And he reacts to it. And what we are seeing here, first of all, is his reaction is a determination that is going to punish the wicked. Look at this in verse 13. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. For the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God is holy. He cannot see us living in sin and then just look the other way. No, a thousand times no. He is a God who must punish sin. But then, praise the Lord. 
He's also a God who determines to save his own people. Look at verse 14. Still speaking to Noah, make for yourself or make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its place. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. So there is the God of mercy. There is the God who's providing the way to escape from ultimate condemnation that is coming upon the earth. And when we push this into the New Testament, we find that this represents salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it is God's initiative who has given Christ that through him we might be saved. And as we were reading earlier on from the scriptures, we saw how he was even using the malice of men, the cowardice of men, in order to bring Jesus to the cross so that through him we might be saved. So it's God's initiative because he is a God of mercy. He is a God of grace. But notice how God again comes back to the theme I will destroy the earth. Verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. That's how serious God is with respect to dealing with sin once and for all. Again, he comes back to his mercy and to his grace. Uh, we read there in verse um, 18 down to verse 21. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be men and female. Of the birds, according to their kinds, and of the animals, according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground, according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also, Take with you every sort of food that is eaten and so store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. These were the instructions that were given to uh, Noah uh, that clearly showed that the God who is there is a God of judgment, a God who must punish sin, and is also a God of love, a God of mercy who saves sinners. The point is, we must never lose sight of these aspects of the true God who is there. God is holy. Don't let anybody ever cheat you. He will punish sin. He will punish sinners. And on the other hand, is also a God of mercy who provides a way of salvation. And this is the message that we need as Christians to continuously share with the world around us so that they too can escape the wrath of God through the means that God himself has given, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in the days between this point and Noah entering into the ark, Noah actually was a preacher. He was going around preaching that the God who is there is a holy God. He's coming to punish sinners. The God who is there is a, is a loving God. And that's why I'm building this ark. 
is the only way of escape. So we read in Second Peter chapter 2 uh, that that's the way he is spoken about. Second Peter uh, chapter 2. And uh, I'll begin reading from verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment day, and then listen to this, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. God sent Noah basically as a preacher that he might proclaim this. But evidently, the fact that only seven people were saved, Noah and his wife, together with their three sons and their wives, it seems that the world did not believe him until it was too late. I wonder what your attitude is with respect to the message that continues to be preached. Wherever you go, which is true to scripture, that God is holy, he must punish sin. That God is love, he has provided a way of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder whether you are still in the category of those who do not believe, or whether you are in the category of those who have believed the message so that you might enter in with Noah. Well, the climax of the story before us is that of a responsible response to God's word as the only way in which we get saved. Salvation comes when you obey God's message, when you obey God's call, when you act responsibly rather than simply continuing life as though God is not warning, as though God hasn't spoken. That's what we notice here from the example of Noah. Noah's salvation depended absolutely on his obeying God by building this mammoth ark and in due season bringing in the animals and the birds before the flood came. Let's quickly read from verse 22 of chapter 6 and go into chapter 7. What I want you to notice is Noah's obedience. God has spoken. What does Noah do? We read in verse 22, Noah did this. What did he do? Exactly what God was telling him to do. He did all that God commanded him. In other words, he began to go into the forest to get the timber cut, drag it to sight, and begin to put it together into this major, major mammoth edifice called an ark. And while he was doing that, he was warning people that the God who is there is disgusted with the sin that surrounds us. And he will act in punishment. The only way of escape is in the ark that I am building. We were not quite sure how long the building project took. But as it came to an end, we enter into chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate. Now the reason why he took the more of the clean animals is because they were the food that they were eating. And consequently, if he only took 
a pair, you know what would happen. Those animals would have disappeared from planet Earth. So he took extra so that they would be able to eat them and also they would, in fact, use them also for any form of sacrifices. But let's go on. Uh, verse 3. And seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the earth. Listen to verse 5. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. You can't miss that. that the, 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 you, you must act on what God tells you to do in order for you to be saved. Knowledge is not enough. I don't know how many times I need to say this because we've got too many people who have the right answer if it was a quiz. They know what the Bible says about salvation, that you must repent, you must believe in Jesus Christ. They know it. But then when you say to them, okay, have you done it? They start speaking in very vague terms. Have you done it? Have you obeyed? Have you repented? Have you believed? They cannot speak in these terms that I have done what the Lord has commanded. And I'm saying to you, there is no salvation without that. Yes, salvation is by the grace of God. But trust me, God will not repent on your behalf. You must repent. God will not believe on your behalf. You must believe. You must do the repenting. You must do the believing. And if you don't, you will perish. It doesn't matter how much you know. You will perish. That's what we are seeing here. And then, this is what we read in verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, they it is, went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. They went in. It wasn't a matter of just listening. They did it. They went in. Of clean animals, and of animals that are not clean, and of birds, and of everything that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. What we're being taught there in terms of suddenly the flood coming is what the Bible in the New Testament uses to warn us concerning the second coming of Christ. It will be that sudden when God finally ends the season of patience with sinners. Turn with me quickly to Matthew and chapter 24. Matthew 24, uh, where the Lord Jesus Christ refers to this. Matthew and chapter 24. Uh, we'll begin reading from verse 37. In fact, we'll just begin a verse earlier with verse 36. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. But concerning the day and hour, referring to his own second coming, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
You see, it's, it's obvious that people were seeing this, the building of this mammoth structure called the ark, but they loved their sin too much. And consequently, they could not be prevailed upon to repent of their sin and consequently become part of this entire activity of building this ark to escape judgment. They continued in their ways, eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage. Oh, that's really where we are, friends. You hear this message over and over again. Repent from your sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn away from everything you know to be wicked. Embrace Christ as your Savior. And you say to yourself, come on. Life has been like this all along. Let's continue eating and drinking. Let's continue marrying and being given in marriage. And so on and so forth. Until finally Noah enters the ark. And my interest particularly is that last verse that we read. And the Lord shut him in. Verse 16. The Lord shut him in. There's a time when evidence is overwhelming. Judgment is coming. Noah is told, now enter before it is too late. He enters with all the animals and so on, and the floods begin to open up. Let's read verse 11 downwards. Just appreciate again the, the, the climax, the, the, the moment when, when God is beginning to open the, the floodgates. And then the waters begin to surge. Listen to verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, of, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. And the windows of the heavens were opened. And rain fell upon the earth. Forty days and forty nights. On that very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons, with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And here it is, and the Lord shut. The point is, when Noah was building the ark, obviously he used to go in and out of that door, in and out. It was inevitable. That's how you, you, you build any structure. You, you're going in and out. You're going in with some timbers, coming out, and so on. But on this particular occasion, this was the final going in. And God shut the door. It was not Noah who shut the door. It was God. In other words, the day of grace is over. Now, judgment must fall. Jesus has made the same point. There's going to be a time when the day of grace will be over. When beyond that, it doesn't matter what you know. If you're outside the kingdom, that's it. God's line of patience has been crossed in the sand of time. That's why postponing your day of salvation is a very dangerous thing to do. You just don't do it. Well, the aftermath, very quickly, the aftermath. And what it speaks about is a time when God's wrath now pours out and mixed. It's not a God of wrath and a God who loves, a God who punishes and a God who saves. There is no salvation after that. It is only a God of wrath, a God who punishes. 
It is destruction. It is perishing. It is the end. Listen to this account from verse 17 downwards. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth. Birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swim on the earth, that swam on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry ground in whose nostril was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth a hundred and fifty days. Friends, we have seen here, the rains continued, the floods came up, and you don't need to be a genius to imagine that individuals began to think, you know what, maybe Noah was right. And some of them, as they noticed that the rains were not stopping, would have begun to go to the ark, run there, and begin to hit on that door. Noah, open! We are perishing out here. But hey, it's not Noah who closed that door. It was God. In other words, it was God's final day of patience that was over. It didn't matter how much they pleaded and cried and wept and screamed. Noah was on the inside, they were on the outside, and they must now perish because God is the one who is now punishing sinners. Friends, it's the same appeal that comes to us. Now you hear, now you are pleaded with, now you are spoken to, to abandon your ways of sin, to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ for dear life's sake. Now you are pleaded with. When that day comes and God shuts the door, it doesn't matter what your theology is. It doesn't matter that you have really, really understood the gospel. The question is, did you put it into practice? Did you repent? Did you believe? That's the issue. And if you didn't, it's too late. It's too late. Say whatever you want. It is too late. The day of salvation is now. And whatever doubts you have, it's better to doubt you're on the inside. That's where you're asking all the questions to Noah, on the inside, rather than to be on the outside and saying, look, until everything is clear, everything is crystal clear, I'm not going to move it. Fair, it's all right. It's you who perish. You're better off sorting out your remaining doubts on the inside. You're on the right side of the door. Well, let me hurry on to close. We've considered the one day in the life of Noah and seen from this why you must never postpone the day of your salvation the day of your repentance, the, the day of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Never do that. Never do that. There's too much that is at stake. And 
Don't look to the numbers. Saying, well, look, everybody seems to be ungodly. Everybody, people don't care about God anymore, and so on. Don't try and find solace in that. Because when God acts, what matters the most is whether you were righteous, whether you were blameless, whether you were working with God. In other words, whether you had entered into this relationship with God through repentance and faith. That is what matters. Don't play with your life. The God who is there is holy. The God who is there is a merciful God. He has provided, as we've already seen, this ark that represents Jesus Christ. Jesus has died an excruciatingly painful death in order to provide the way of salvation. But that door will not always be open. It will not always be open. So the day of salvation is now. In Jesus Christ, we have a sufficient Savior. One who is indeed a strong and perfect plea before Almighty God on our behalf. He stands before the throne of God and can speak to God sufficiently for us to truly be safe in Him. But let me ask, even today, have you trusted in Him? Have you? Have you taken that decisive step in your life where you've abandoned sin and embraced the Savior? Oh, may this one day in the life of Noah, the day when God shut him in the ark, be a sufficient warning to you to repent and to believe and to do so now. Let us pray. Our great and glorious Father in heaven, we plead that you might not pass us by. This account that led to the destruction of thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps even millions who were on the earth, might stand as a stark warning to us that to a God of holiness, a God of justice, a God who must punish sin. And Lord, we thank you that that same day, with you closing the ark, the door of the ark speaks of a God who saves. Help us to be like Noah, to obey the gospel, and to obey it today through genuine repentance of sin, through genuine belief in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, help us today to turn from sin and to embrace Jesus Christ as Savior. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.